This episode was brought to you by Slate Black Industries. For M-Lock grips and accessories, visit slateblackindustries.com. Tango Romeo, Tango Romeo 6, this is Rooftop Actual. We are Lima Delta, could you lead us in please? Over. Rooftop Actual, good copy, stand by. Single shot through the engine block. 200. Impact. Impact. Okay. 250. I may have to hold off to the left a little bit. Just start to, yeah. Yeah. Impact, dead center. Impact. Okay. On a 300. Impact. Impact. I am feeling a little bit more back pressure than uh, when we don't use a suppressor. Yep. All right, 350. Okay, I'm just gonna maybe hover slightly over it. Okay. Just high. Okay. Left edge. Impact. Impact. Okay, those are actually dead on holds. Okay, 400. Maybe I'm going to just hover over this one because that first, that 350 when I hovered over, it was a miss over. Yeah. Okay, off the left side. High. Okay, bump it down. Yeah, uh, maybe about half a target. Okay, that was high, high by about half a target. Uh, right by about two-thirds of a target. Why don't I switch to iron sights? Okay. Uh, that way I can uh, I can right. judge my elevation a little easier. Yeah, and where are you going to hold low, right? Yeah, I'm going to hold low like below the six o'clock. All right, I'm on at 400. Okay. Just off the right edge. Impact. Impact. Okay. Yeah, so basically I'm putting a gap in between the target and the uh, top of the iron sights and favoring left just ever so slightly. And that's because your irons are zeroed at 450 Correct. yards or 400 meters. Correct. Right? So, I mean, the way I zero iron sights sometimes, some of my rifles, I like to do a six o'clock hold. Yeah. It's beneficial. It's beneficial, sort of like how the Swiss do it um, on range targets because you can actually see your target that right. you're shooting at. Okay, well I'm on at 450. Okay, 450. Send one more without an adjustment. Impact. Okay. 
That was a hit. That was a hit. That was a hit. I That's saw... two. 500. Just off the left edge. I think that might have been just under, but use the same hold. Yeah, low. Impact. Impact. Good hit. Woo -hoo -hoo. All right. 12 and a half inch barrel. Let's go. <laughs> Irene, baby, yeah. cleared the course. I was, uh, for, for a 12 and a half, I mean, that was a clean run, but at the same time, that's kind of a misnomer saying for a 12 and a half. Right. I think that's a great place to, to kick off the conversation here because, you know, there's conceptually, there's definitely misnomers associated with how and what is capable with different barrel lengths. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the difference between, say, something like this, which is a 14.5, and the 12 and a half. There's actually not a lot right. as far as velocity In goes. terms of velocity. So there's, there's a misnomer that exists in terms of uh, you lose approximately 100 feet per second per inch of barrel lost. Mm -hmm. So between the 14 and a half and the 10 and a half inch barrels, it's immense. Yeah, there's I a mean, substantial. 400, I think, was really difficult for the 10 and a half. Yeah, once we got past 300, the 10 and a half, I mean, it was, yeah, well, it wasn't we, awesome. It we was couldn't see awesome. a lot of plate movement. How were the plate movements? I could see the plate movements out of the 12 and a half. So, same ammo, 55 M193s. Yeah. So the the difference in velocity between these two are roughly, I would say, maybe about like 50, 70 yeah. feet per second. Yeah, 50 to 70, right? But then at the same time, the amount of maneuverability, being able to flush mount the, uh, the, the suppressor, I mean, that's immense. If we got to pick kind of one barrel length that we had to do everything with, mm -hmm. i.e. what this carbine is sort of is for you, you the, the, Anywhere between like a, the high, the lowest being 11 and a half up to the 14 and a half are kind of the range that we really gravitate towards. Yeah. When I was in the military, the, the, the idea was you have to have co-witness optics. Yeah. Otherwise it was terrible. Mm -hmm. um, when I've left the military, I've realized that's not exactly the case. Right. Because the optics, so this one being zeroed at 200 meters, I was able to effectively use the it. The red dot to, you're yeah, referencing, right. Pretty much out to 350. Mm -hmm. You saw me still making pretty effective hits. Yeah. I switched out to, at 400 yards, I switched to the iron sights, which were a lollipop hold, a six o'clock zero that I learned from Swiss rifles, mm -hmm. um, and Mike from Bloke on the Range. Uh, and that seemed to be actually quite ideal because I could engage a four, 450, and five yeah, um, going from a, a low hold to mm -hmm. kind of a low off target yep. to low on target to dead on target, yep. right? And and I was able to to entirely neg negotiate. You know, the, that's uh, a good distance. that's a good point for us to then talk about uh, the aperture that you used on this because I know there was a lot of commentary on the A1 video about well you guys flipped to the large open night sight or low <laughs> low light visibility sight at distance that was a mistake. So we've been getting a lot of feedback on our M16A1 series sights, and I wanted to take this opportunity to address some of the misconceptions that may be out there. But instead of quoting our 18 months of service in the Marine Corps as a Lance Corporal in the mid-80s, I'm going to go ahead and quote an actual M16A1 TM. Now right here you see the M16A1, and you look at the rear sights, it's got a two-position rear sight. One is marked L for long range, and both of the aperture diameters are in fact the same. The long range sights bump your original zero from 200 meters up to three to 400 meter engagements. Simple and effective combat rear sights. Now, the L again is not for low light. How could this have gotten confused? Some people may have been issued what you see on the Gordon carbine, one is a large 7mm sight and the other one marked L for long range and the large diameter sight is for low life. The small diameter sight is the one marked L for long range. Some guys may have been issued these sights during the 70s or the 80s instead of the regular late 60s A1 sights. This may be a source of confusion for a lot of people. And that may be why people keep on telling me that I should not have used the L sight for long distance. However, for the garden carbine, 
I use the small diameter sight. I use that for the 400 meter engagement and the aim point at 200. And you saw that was fairly effective. Regardless, the L is always on the smaller diameter aperture. We'll cut a little bit more of a video on this topic a little later on why sometimes even though people qualified experts, memories could be hazy. But as far as right now, thanks for watching so far and we'll go back into the regular content. The M16 video, I zeroed that rifle as per military specifications, meaning I did the 25 meter zero with the short range sight. Uh, and then I trued it at uh, 200 yeah. and, and I zeroed it with the post on the target, the point of impact. Mm -hmm. Point of aim was point of impact for that, not the six o'clock hold. Right. So it did not allow me the extra versatility in using those iron sights. Um, and, and, and when you say that, when you say it didn't allow you the extra versatility, you're saying because you're not using a six o'clock hold, you're not able to mm -hmm. see the target. Yep. And therefore, when you get to needing to push beyond where the site is zeroed at, you're fully well, losing the target behind yes, the site. Your elevation's entirely off if that's the only distance you can use it at. I mean, what's the right answer? Should you use the mil spec way or not? I mean, what distance are you using it? I mean, it's, it's entirely up to you. For the M16, the A1 series anyways, they didn't expect for it to push past 400 meters, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. quite frankly. I mean, the Marines, even when they zeroed, they had DIs coming around to the recruits front sights and use a nail to increase the elevation. Right, that's an important point as well, is that you know, practically speaking, are you going to be trying to adjust your front sight with the tip of a round or a, mm -hmm. a nail or a tool? I mean, in the middle of an engagement, I, I don't see how that would no. be possible. No. But again, maybe yeah. who knows? But then at the same time, like what is your engagement distance with that particular weapon system? Right, right. So on this particular carbine, you've got a low light setting, but mm -hmm. you are using the smaller aperture. I setting. am using the smaller aperture sight just for the longer distance engagement because mm -hmm. I can actually get a better sight picture yeah. for longer distance engagements with iron sights as opposed to red dot sights. And that's, I mean, that's... If we haven't crushed this by now, that iron sights are inaccurate and difficult to engage at long distance, it takes time and practice. Uh, I personally practiced a lot with it because I liked NRA matches mm -hmm. and I didn't like spending a lot of money on gizmos when <laughs> I was in college. Um, and so that is a part of it that you can't say iron sights are inaccurate. If they were inaccurate, then people People wouldn't be fighting wars. Yeah, with them I mean, there, the there are a lot of people who have been put in the ground by guns yeah. with iron sights. So, um, I mean, in the long run, 12 and a half inch barrel, 55 grain ammo, mm -hmm. dual sighting system. Uh, it's a viable platform if you put the time into it. Yes, that's a key point. If you put the time into it. Yeah. And you, that doesn't necessarily change just because you throw an optic on either, like a mm -hmm. magnified optic. You know, there, it's certainly easier to see things. Sure. But it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be more accurate as a shooter. Yeah. You have to learn how to use whatever system you end up utilizing. Yeah. And that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. I like to say thanks to our friend Rex, actually, for leading us in with the awesome intro. Amazing channel. If you haven't seen his, uh, his channel, he talks a lot about long-range shooting. Um, actually, the Sniper 101 is the entry course to a lot of amateur shooters, I would say, mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that note, Irene? Irene! Fucking Irene! Do you enjoy arguing with other viewers on the internet on which rifle performed better on practical accuracy? Well, we have a solution for you. Go to our Patreon page and scroll down. You'll find the practical accuracy scoreboard where we have ranked and compiled all the data of all the firearms we have tested on the practical accuracy course. Furthermore, it's already separated into the different categories, so you can go back to your argument as quickly as possible. And whether you decide to support us via Patreon, subscription, or just a normal viewer, we thank you. Sniper 1-6, this is Joe Knight 6, 4 Vic, 8 Pats, Redcon 1, Green to Green, top copy over. Joe Knight 6, this is Sniper 1-6, Roger, over. Sniper 1 six, Bill Knight 1, 1 Pack, Green Green, over. Sniper 1-6, Roger, over. Sniper 1-6, Bill 
Welcome one. Okay.